today I'm going to do a brew day video. It's something I've thought about for a while, but I had never done. I thought in particular I'd share my Pilsner recipe and processes with everyone, because I think it's pretty darn good. So as I started preparing for this, I thought, well, I can actually introduce a couple additional topics and variables into it to get the most out of it. So first, you'll see my typical standard lagered Pilsner, uh, very, very traditional European style. I'll include the recipe at the end of this video, so if you're so inclined, you can try it yourself. Then I'll, I'll share some derivatives from that. They use some slightly different hops and also some different kinds of yeast. In particular, the White Labs 060 blended ale lager hybrid yeast. Works great. And as long as I was going down that path, I thought I'm going to do something that I've read about and seen some other videos on. And that's using the Fermentist Saf Lager 3470 dry yeast, which I typically don't use, and I'm going to ferment at ale temperatures. A lot of very positive results have been shared using this process, so I thought, well, gee, if it's a way to get things a little bit quicker, which this time around I really need to do, it's certainly worth a try. So go ahead, watch the video, and again, if you want a real classic standard Pilsner Lager recipe and process, you'll see that. If you want a slightly modified version, you'll see that too. And then in the case of the yeast, quite a bit of a different process and experiment around all that. I'm looking for good results and pretty excited to do this. Let's get going. This is the end product that we're shooting for. Crisp, clean, beautiful Pilsner beer. Let's see how close we get. First things first, let's collect our water. Note that I use a filter. Now we're going to dough in our grain. This is basically just adding the grain to the hot strike water. We want to make sure to mix it thoroughly so we don't have any grain balls form. I'm going to fish around and try to find a, a one or two I can show you this effect and why it's so important to do a good job mixing in the grains. Okay, here's one that I was able to capture. You can see that basically the grain is packed into a ball. The inside is totally dry, so it's not going to do any good whatsoever. And so we just want to continue to make sure to stir this in as thoroughly as possible. During the mash, I recirculate the wort from the bottom of the ton up to the top of the grain bed. I'm heating the uh, recirculated wort with that induction cooktop underneath and regulating the speed of the recirculation process by that little DC motor. By doing this, it keeps the grain all at the same constant temperature and it also really clarifies the wort. All right, the mash is done and it's time to sparge. You'll notice that I take the wort out of the mash tun, through the pump here, back up to the output valve of the brew kettle and pump it in that way. I've got my sparge water set at 175 degrees, gently sprinkling across the grain bed and pumping on into the brew kettle itself. As the sparge gets close to completion, I start taking gravity readings of the work collected. I have a specific target pre-boil gravity that I'm shooting for, and once I get to that point, I just stop. This is in contrast to, I think, what a lot of people do, where they're going to gain six, seven gallons, whatever, and then stop. I like to be a little more systematic about it and make sure that I collect exactly what I want to. Now it's time for the boil. You'll see I have the amount of work collected at the proper gravity, about 12 and a half gallons here. I'm going to go ahead and be sanitizing in parallel 
I have all my hops laid out, my whirl flock tablet laid out so I don't forget anything once things really start moving along. I'll slow things down now as we get ready for the transfer. You can see that I'm set up with my plate chiller. I've got that thermometer set up so I can monitor the transferred wort into the fermenter. You'll notice this particular batch, actually I was doing the traditional lagering process, hence holding that temperature at 55 degrees while I'm going into the transfer. Goes through the plate chiller, being cooled by water, and then up into the top of the fermenter. Now I always make it a point of saving my cooling water because then I can use it for my cleanup later. Okay, we are one and a half days into it. And as you can see, this fermentation is very active. I actually went ahead and set up the uh, chiller. Back there you can see I have it set at 19 degrees Celsius, which is about 66 degrees. So I am controlling the temperature here to keep it in a um, suitable range so the temperature just doesn't run away with this very active fermentation. But I wanted to show you that. Also, the uh, wonderful aroma of a slight sulfur is in the air indicative of a lager fermenting. So far so good. Here's a shot of the yeast during the act of fermentation. All this energy is what causes the temperature rise as your beer ferments. This is why having some kind of temperature control is advisable. Okay, it's been five full days of active fermentation and now we're done. And I can tell we're done because I actually take a sample, use my refractometer to measure the uh, gravities, and it came in about 1.008, which is about four points below where I thought it would be. So I'm pretty pleased with that. Very uh, complete fermentation. To recap what the plan is, I've got an event coming up next weekend. So I need to take three gallons of this and put it in a little uh, three-gallon keg here. I'll force carbonate and have something to serve next weekend. So that'll be good. But then, with the extra five gallons that will still be in the fermenter, I'm gonna leave it there, let it cold condition for another week, and then I'll go ahead and transfer it out, and I'll put it into my five gallon keg here, where I'll use some gelatin to really clarify it, let it kind of finish the process a little more like I think it should be done, but then we'll try the two. We'll see if it doesn't really make a difference. So what have I done so far today? First off, I took the blow-off tube off and I put it on my pressure regulator so I could put about C, uh, five pounds of CO2 in, into the conical fermenter here. I'm doing that because as you cold crash either your conical, your carboy, whatever you might be using, the pressure is going to drop. It's going to want to draw in uh, anything that it can. So if you still have your pickup, your, your blow-off tube on it, it's going to start to suck up your sanitizer into your beer. Really don't want that. So I've got the system sealed and closed now with a little bit of pressure on it using this guy. Um, I did go ahead just for evaluation pull off some of the yeast from the bottom dump port of the conical just to take a look at it. I gotta tell you this is beautiful. I, I capture yeast all the time and this is that beautiful creamy wonderful stuff you see on other YouTubes. So very uh, impressed with that. Again, the 3470 yeast, something I've never used before. So far, I'm kind of a fan. So we're at the point now where the fermentation's done. Had I done a full actual lager style process, I would have cold fermented around 55 or so for at least a few weeks, let the temperature come up to do my dacetal rest, 
and I'd be at the same point where I am right now because I fermented this the entire time at that temperature. So now we're at the point where we're going to start walking the temperature down. And I'm going to go about 4 degrees, 5 degrees per day. This is another point where you see a lot of people talking about it has to be 1 degree. It can be anything. It can cold crash. My opinion is probably get pretty good results with most all of these things. In reading some of the yeast suppliers recommendations, it is a slightly slower uh, step down as opposed to just putting it in to uh, darn near freezing conditions and bring the temperature right down. But hey, everyone has their uh, processes and, and what they like to do. I, I'm pretty open to all of them. I've got the uh, chiller back there uh, running. You can see the temperature control unit on the back is how I'm going to control that temperature to bring it down gradually. And in about a week, I'll be at the point where I'll fill up this little three gallon keg and uh, have uh, first results uh, to see how it is. I will say this though, of course, I can't resist trying it along the process. Really tastes good. I think, uh, frankly, I'm surprised. So we have a little yet further to go. I'll make sure to keep uh, you posted on how things are coming along. And then we'll definitely do the side by side comparison of the rather hurried three gallon version and the somewhat more patient and thorough five gallon version and see what the differences really are. I think it should be a lot of fun. So stand tight and we'll take a look. Okay, the project's done and it's time to talk about the results. In the course of two to three weeks, we came up with a really nice lager beer. We did it with very little temperature control and truthfully, I think the processes anybody could replicate if they want to try this at home. So let's talk about the difference between my three gallon batch at two weeks versus this current one, which was what was left in the fermenter for another few weeks and discuss is there really much of a difference. I gotta say, no, how about that? Kind of a surprise. Trying to put more effort into it, more time, did not really make much of a difference. Now the one area where you could tell the two apart was in the clarity. Because of course, rushing into the keg, force carbonating it, and serving it the next day, really is gonna not give a lot of time for the, that beer to clear up. This particular beer, I actually put the gelatin on it in the fermenter, it worked okay. Not nearly as good as some of our results in the past, but still pretty good. So I'll include a couple extra pictures so you can see what we're talking about. So I would say this. If you like your Pilsners, go ahead and give this process a shot. Soft Lager 3470, ale temperatures, ale timing. You're going to come out with a beer I think you like. I had to put my recipe in the description below and you can play with that, do something similar, guaranteed it's going to be pretty good. So as always, I appreciate you watching, brew up some beer, comment back to me, and we'll pick up a next topic next time around. Take care.